monthly, the committee publishes articles and toolbox talks on various safety subjects. These can be viewed and downloaded from the ASA site, www.asa.net. Also available on the ASA site are recordings and downloads from previous webinars. All of these items are available free to the public. Look for the safety resources link on the ASA page, which is located at www.asa.net. If you have any problems, please contact Ben Stevens or Dan Hilton at ASA for assistance. This webinar is being recorded for later viewing. Everyone that registered for the webinar will receive an email notifying them when the replay of the webinar and their previous presentation is available and a link to that location. If you have registered for the ASA Education Foundation showroom series, you're in the wrong webinar. We appreciate your patience and for re-registering for today's safety webinar and we apologize for any inconvenience. All attendees are in mute mode. To submit a question during the presentation, you can enter it in the chat window. Before you send it, be sure the settings are sent to organizers and panelists so we can see the question. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation as time allows. Also, a document with all questions and their answers and other documents related to the webinar will be posted on the ASA site, along with the replay of the webinar. Before I introduce our guest today, I'd like to draw your attention to the ASA Suppliers Partners shown on the screen and say thanks to these supporters and their industry leadership. The presenter today is Michael Taylor. Mr. Taylor is an attorney representing management exclusively in workplace law and related litigation. He has litigated hundreds of OSHA citations both at the federal level and state level and has managed over 50 cases involving fatalities. He's provided assistance to defense counsel in civil and criminal cases where OSHA inspections and citations are at issue. He previously served as Acting General Counsel of the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission, the federal administrative agency in charge of adjuncting safety and health workplace disputes between OSHA and private industry. He also served as Chief Legal Counsel and Special Advisor to the Chairman of the Occupational Safety and Health Review Commission. Full bio of the present presenter will be posted with the webinar documentation on the ASA site. I'll now turn the presentation over to Michael. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, this is probably one of the most increasing uh, areas of the law where I get a lot of questions from clients from a broad range of industries, industries ranging from the oil industry to the baking industry to healthcare. Uh, transportation. I get a lot of calls on this because of, you know, the publicity for workplace violence um, is increasing. And OSHA is starting to get into this area of the law a little bit more than they have in the past. Although, and I'll explain to you a little bit later, um, they're a little bit selective in uh, coming out and doing inspections where you've had workplace violence. But, you know, they have a compliance directive that outlines some things that they believe that you should do for preventative measures in areas where they believe are high risk. And even if you're not in one of these high risk areas, a lot of things that are in this compliance directive are very useful, primarily to minimize your civil liability or criminal liability regarding workplace violence. Um, with that, let's get started. What is workplace violence? NIOSH, the National um, uh, Occupational Institute Safety and Health has defined workplace violence as violence, violent acts, uh, physical threats uh, directed towards persons at work or on duty. So it's kind of broad, if you will, because there are lots of threats of violence um, 
whether it's assault or homicide, those kind of things. So kind of broad. OSHA has kind of taken a little bit of the same view, although they've given you a little bit more flavor of, of their opinion on this. OSHA has defined workplace violence as an act or threat of violence, harassment, intimidation, or other threatening disruptive behavior that occurs at the work, work site. It ranges from threats and verbal abuse to physical assault and even homicide. Everybody knows that you know, threats to kill someone or actual homicide is workplace violence, but what about a boss who's uh, kind of a bully, whether it's a male or female, intimidation, those kind of things. Does that really fall in the cubbyhole of workplace violence? Well, OSHA believes yes, although they've uh, carved out some exceptions about when they're, they're going to get involved, and I have some thoughts on that. OSHA has indicated that an instance of workplace violence is presumed to be work-related if it results from an event occurring in the workplace. So, well, what does that mean? Because a, a lot of questions that I get is, if someone from a member of the public comes onto their, their site, uh, a private property for whatever reason, and commits a ho homicide, how is that work-related? Well, the fact that it actually happens in your workplace and your employees are exposed to this, OSHA believes that it is indeed work-related. It's kind of the same thing for record-keeping. Why does workplace violence matter? Well, you know, I was started doing some research on workplace violence in the last you know, 20 years in particular, but focused really more or less uh, on the last 15 years or so. And the, the statistics are quite alarming. Nearly 2 million workers uh, report have been victims of workplace violence each year. That's quite a bit. Um, although, you know, some of that is threats of violence and those kind of things, and it doesn't really spell out the difference between coworker violence and uh, other types of violence, which I'll get into a little bit later. It's remained uh, among the top four causes of death for the last 15 years. Uh, Bureau of Labor statistic data shows that an average of 590 workplace homicides a year exists from 2000 to 2009. That number is astonishing. Homicides was the number one cause of workplace death for women in 2009. So you can see some of these stats are pretty alarming. So I think that's one of the reasons why, and plus with the media today you know, publicizing these types of events, that's why OSHA is focusing on this. Nearly four out of every 1,000 workers suffered from like a non-fatal violence in 2009. And the survey results that I viewed showed that these are the kind of areas where OSHA views as high risk. Uh, workplace violence in law enforcement, like 19%, 13% in retail, primarily late night retail, and 10% worked in the medical occupation, such as nursing homes, psychiatric facilities, um, you know, clinics for um, uh, pharmaceutical clinics for distributing drugs, those kind of things. What are the types of workplace violence? Well, there are very different things that can happen from different types of people when they commit workplace violence uh, on your work site. There are four general categories. One is, you know, the person who's committing the violence has no legitimate relationship to your work site whatsoever and just enters the place to commit a robbery or uh, other, some other kind of criminal act. Most of the time, it's robbery. So you have this person that is not affiliated with your workplace that comes in and does these kind of things. Um, or the person is the recipient or the object of some kind of service you provide by um, the workplace or the victim. But the example would be uh, a, psych you know, a hospital, for example. Third, the individual has an employment relationship with the workplace. Here, the example is coworker. Um, Coworker violence. So whether it's hourly employee gets hourly employee, or management versus management, or management versus hourly, you know, those kind of relationships. And fourth, the individual has no direct relationship with the workplace, but typically has a relationship with an employee. Perfect example here is a spouse that, um, for whatever reason, has conflict with one of your workers. So those are the four main categories, one being 
no direct relationship. Two, the recipient of some kind of service. Three, the employee has, uh, you're talking about really coworker about, uh, workplace violence. And four, um, there's some kind of relationship with an employee in your workplace. OSHA doesn't have a standard or a regulation that governs workplace violence. So what OSHA relies on for enforcement is uh, the general duty clause. For those of you that are not aware, the general duty clause is kind of the catch-all for OSHA enforcement, Section 5A1 of the OSH Act, which basically says employers have to free, uh, free you know, eliminate hazards uh, that the employer or the industry recognizes that are that cause or likely to cause death or serious physical harm, and there's a feasible means to abate that particular hazard. OSHA has recognized that in certain circumstances, workplace violence um, is an occupational hazard and can be considered a general duty clause violation if you do not take steps to eliminate that particular hazard. Although OSHA has set forth in the compliance directive that they're not going to investigate every workplace violence uh, issue that you have. And I think the reason for that is because they don't have the resources to come out and do inspections every time you have a, let's say, a coworker threat of violence or a coworker uh, assaulting another coworker. Uh, because this is so prevalent in the American workplace, I think that that's the reason why OSHA's has in this enforcement policy that it's not going to really do an inspection in those kind of cases, but I'll talk about that in just a minute. What are the elements to prove a general duty clause violation? There are four elements. Really, the first element is that you had a hazard, here it would be workplace violence, and you failed to um, eliminate that hazard in which employees were exposed. The industry in which you work or you recognize that hazard, uh, you the employer, and the hazard caused or was likely to cause death or serious physical harm. And there's a way you could have, a method you could have used or methods to prevent workplace violence from happening. So those are the four basic elements in terms of an OSHA citation that you may get if you have workplace violence. And these are the kind of guides that you want to rely on to try to develop a plan to minimize that risk. And I'll talk about that in just a second. In addition to the general duty clause, there are other things, uh, other, just to, for your information, other standards in which um, indirectly apply to workplace violence. And I'll go through them here. One is record keeping. Uh, so if you have an incident where an employee gets injured, um, you have a duty to record that injury under the record keeping regulation. If you don't do that, you get a record keeping violation. The other one is medical services and first aid. Whether you're in the general industry or construction, general industry standards are 1910, construction industry standards are 1926. It's basically you know, making sure that you have uh, the right uh, people and the right um, equipment to respond to workplace violence. And the last one is an emergency action plan. Kind of like if you were to have a fire in your building, what kind of emergency action plan do you have in the event that someone comes into your facility to commit a robbery, for example, and starts uh, opening fire? What, how are they going to evacuate? Those kind of things. It's the same thing uh, that you would implement if you're going to have a, an explosion or a fire. So in addition to general duty clause, these are some of the other standards that would apply in a workplace violence uh, inspection or potentially citation. This, these are some of the areas where if you put a workplace violence program together, you want to make sure that you cover all these bases uh, in your program. All right, let's talk about OSHA inspections. Another big question I get is, uh, OK, I have workplace violence exists. I, you know, I recognize it. Is OSHA ever going to show up and under what circumstances? Well, the compliance directive kind of spells out um, when OSHA is going to initiate its inspection. We'll talk about it now. They may issue, may issue uh, initiate an inspection when someone calls and makes a complaint 
could be an employee, for example, a referral. Uh, let's say it's the media puts it in the newspaper and the OSHA sees it, that there was workplace violence. Um, maybe no one died, but there was an issue of workplace violence. Or a fat fatality or cat catastrophic event. Uh, those of you who are not aware, if you have a fatality or in hospitalization of three or more employees, if you're talking about federal OSHA, you have a duty to report that to OSHA, and that's how OSHA may get involved. So if you have a fatality as a result of workplace violence, OSHA may initiate an inspection. Or OSHA may show up at your work site to conduct a program inspection um, where workplace violence has been identified as a particular issue. So OSHA may come to do, let's say, a national emphasis program inspection or a local emphasis program inspection or a site-specific targeting inspection. And during that inspection, they under, uh, un uncover that workplace violence is an issue with your industry or at that particular work site, and they decide to conduct an inspection in that to see if you are complying with the general duty clause or some of those other regulations that I pointed out to you. Here is the here is the key and to the second bullet point. OSHA generally will not initiate inspections in response to coworker or personal threats of violence. When I first read the compliance directive, I made me scratch my head because this is where most of the violence occurs. Um, clearly, the people from members of the public that um, let's say if you have a, a bank uh, and a criminal comes in and robs a bank and uh, shoots everyone or, or opens fires, whatever, that's obvious. Um, and OSHA will get involved in those kind of incidents, but they will not get involved in a re response to a coworker or, um, let's say, a spouse is threatening one of your workers. Now, that's not to say, even though OSHA may not get involved in terms of conducting inspection and issue citations, the things that OSHA recommends for you to do to prevent workplace violence in these high-risk areas you know, my recommendation to clients is to do the same thing because it prevents uh, civil liability uh, down the road. Initiating inspections will typically require, on, for, this is OSHA's viewpoint, where you have known risk factors, and I'll go over those, evidence of employer and industry recognition, as I talked about, and that there are feasible means of abatement to address those hazards like workplace violence. What are the risk factors? Well, there are a list of things. Um, factors that could increase the risk of violence includes, for example, working with the public or volatile, unstable people. Example here would be a pharmacy or uh, a mental health facility. Um, that's a perfect example for the first risk, risk factor. Working alone or in isolated areas, it could be um, uh, a late night uh, retail establishment, for example, that's uh, not out in the open. Handling or guarding money and valuables, an armored truck, for example, providing services of care, could be just a doctor's office, for example, where alcohol is served. Uh, it could be just right, you know, that an example would be just a, a bar, for example. Work, working late at night or early morning hours. Example with this would be maybe. Um, uh, a taxi cab service, uh, that's an example. Working in areas with high crime rates. This one kind of scratched my head because does that mean um, you know you need to analyze your crime statistics uh, in your city and figure out are you in a high risk category? Uh, for example, Baltimore has a high, high crime rate in the city. So the fact that you have a, a workplace in Baltimore, does that mean that you have a high crime rate and therefore you have this risk factor, so therefore you must develop a, a workplace violence prevention program. So OSHA really doesn't provide much guidance in this area. Delivering passengers' goods or services could be transporting um, uh, goods, a truck driver, for example. So these are the risk factors that OSHA identifies, and it's pretty, pretty broad, uh, and it does provide you some guidance, although some of it's a little bit ambiguous, particularly like high crime rates. So those are the known risk factors for workplace violence. Assessing the risk in your workplace. Well, what are some of the things that you can do, whether you're in a high risk category or not, um, that you can do to assess your risk of workplace violence and implement feasible abatement methods to prevent that from happening or minimizing the risk? 
with some of the things that OSHA has talked about is conduct your research on your prior violent events in your workplace in your particular industry. So this may be just in talking to some of your managers, figuring out, um, you know, have there been suspicious activity in the past or any prior violent events? Um, you know, your industry is your industry at high risk for workplace violence for whatever reason, uh, whether you're late night or retail, um, or you're dealing with members of the public. Consider the number of employees present during the evening and late night hours. How many people are handling money or goods? Because those typically are the people that are most at risk um, for workplace violence. Where, like for example, you have a someone a member of the public that is going to commit a crime. Review your physical facilities, uh, including whether access into the building is controlled and whether there's a system in place to alert employees of intruders. An example here would be. Uh, you know, cameras. Do you have cameras uh, positioned in appropriate places? Like convenience stores do that. More and more convenience stores are doing this to minimize uh, workplace violence, as well as alarms. So if you're closing shop and you're still in the workplace and you close it up and someone tries to break in, there's an alarm system in place to alert the employees, as well as maybe tying that to the local police department. You can also analyze the effectiveness of your existing system for reporting, handling, or preventing incidents of workplace violence. A lot of sophisticated clients that I have really don't have any, uh, and when I mean sophisticated, have been in, in, in business for 25 years or plus, really don't have a system in place for reporting workplace violence and how you handle those kind of things and um, because it's such a touchy subject. Uh, and workplace violence has given this broad meaning, anything from intimidation to threats to actual homicide. Um, a lot of companies have have difficulties putting together this um, you know, reporting requirements and then how do they respond to those kind of things and investigate. So that's probably one of the m most important things that you could do. And I've helped a lot of, a lot of clients do that. What are some of the main risk uh, industries where OSHA's taken the position that these industries know that workplace violence is a recognized hazard. Um, three things, really, is late night retail establishments, convenience stores, as I talked about, liquor stores, and gas stations. Um, the second being healthcare and social services facilities, psychiatric facilities, hospital emergency rooms, community mental health clinics, drug abuse treatment clinics, pharmacies, care. Uh, care facilities, OSHA issued within the, I think it was in the last three or four months, they issued a pretty hefty penalty. And I, I forgot the name of the employer, pretty hefty penalty for the employer where there was a, an employee dealing with uh, someone. Well, I think the employee went to the person's house to because they were going to go into a, a psychiatric facility or a hospital um, for treatment for mental health. And that person ended up stabbing the employee, and the employee died. And OSHA issued a citation in that aspect. So uh, I, I don't know why OSHA issued the citation, but it's primarily because this person was engaged in a high-risk industry. And the final one is the taxi industry, where they at risk for uh, late-night bur uh, burglaries and those kind of things, or robberies. Employer recognition. So now we're talking about employer recognition, not necessarily um, your industry. It's almost like no good deed goes unpunished. If you put your head in the sand, you really don't recognize the hazard. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to differentiate between doing that, doing that, and um, you know, putting yourself in a position where, if this ever happens, you've taken steps to minimize that risk. Um, Employee recognition is an employer that has experienced acts of workplace violence, right? Well, unless you have a uh, procedure in place for employees to report these kind of things, and unless you have a system in place on how to respond to those kind of things before it escalates, um, you're not going to really be in a position to analyze your prior incidents of workplace violence um, or become aware of those threats and intimidations before they lead to homicide. So. Uh, you know, I, I advise clients not to put your head in the sand, but to take, uh, even though you might not have, n might not now know that you've had incidents in the past, 
uh, I encourage clients to go ahead and put this um, reporting procedure in place and uh, do some investigation to figure out what's been happening in the past so you can develop a plan to minimize that risk. So on one hand, by going out and analyzing uh, this, you are recognizing the hazard if it turns out that you have incidents in the past. But on the other hand, uh, by doing this, you're able to implement abatement methods to minimize the risk for this real, uh, uh, homicide from happening in the future, even though you may not be in a, a high-risk category. What are some of the things that OSHA looks at to proving employer recognition? Um, these are the same things that I advise clients to do in terms of trying to figure out how to implement feasible abatement methods. By doing these kind of things, you are recognizing the hazard, but I believe you're better off um, doing these things and finding out the likelihood of, of workplace violence happening in your workplace so you can minimize the risk. But by doing these things, the caveat is you're, it will be easy to prove that you recognize the hazard. But it only really becomes relevant if you don't implement those abatement methods. So let's go through them. What are some of the, what's some of the evidence that OSHA will look at? Well, they'll look at documentation of any employees informing you of the hazard or related inspections of the employer, your awareness of any prior incidents, injuries, or close calls related to workplace violence. So these are some of the things that you would unco uncover if you were to do an in investigation uh, in your workplace to try to implement these controls to minimize a homicide down the road. Documentation of how the employer currently addresses workplace violence. An example would be Okay, you figured out what the abatement methods would be and you put a plan in place. So it really, this really only becomes relevant if you don't put that plan in place. So you have it on paper, but you're just not following it. OSHA 300 log, where you have incidents of workplace violence, or OSHA may show up and start to interview some management employees or, or, or hourly employees, for example, and figure out that you, you've actually made this to the attention of the employer and the employer's done nothing. So those are the kind of things that OSHA will look to to figure out if you actually recognize the hazard. But by the same token, these are the kind of things that you're going to look at to figure out what, what can we do to minimize the risk of workplace violence. So what are some of the feasible abatement methods um, that you can implement to minimize the risk or eliminate the risk of workplace violence? OSHA has put together a pretty good list of things that you can do. Whether you're in a high-risk category, high-risk in industry like taxi cabs or not, uh, these are some things that I work with clients that um, have implemented to minimize the risk of workplace violence. Conduct a workplace violence hazard analysis. Um, same thing you, you way you would do a hazard assessment in your workplace to figure out what PPE folks need to wear, need to, wear to minimize the exposure to those hazards. Assess any plans for new construction or physical changes in the facility uh, to eliminate or reduce security hazards. So if you know you're going to add on to your facility or you're going to alter it in some way where there may be less lighting, for example, then make sure you implement, install correct lighting so that doesn't happen or, and or uh, you want to put, maybe put alarms in place. Train folks on workplace violence. To me, that's one of the most important things that you can do to minimize the risk of workplace violence because a lot of folks react in such a way as um, based on their experience of watching things on TV and really don't know what their rights are um, or what they should do. Training is very, very important. Engineering, implement appropriate engineering controls, and that would be like alarms or a, a, a a security system to get into the place of employment if you're talking about late night stuff. Appropriate administrative controls, maybe have a security guard at your facility if you're open at 2 a.m. And if you do get complaints from employees, respond to all those complaints promptly so that you can take steps to minimize that risk. So this Feasible abatement methods that I just talked about, so those are, work hand in hand with work, putting together a workplace violence prevention program. Um, it can really help prevent and reduce the incidence of workplace violence and is considered an abatement measure by OSHA. And whether you're 
whether or not OSHA ever shows up to do an inspection, these things are, are, are helpful to you um, and to your employees uh, to minimize that risk. And some of the things that your program should include according to OSHA, uh, which are, are pretty, good, uh, pretty good advice, a policy statement regarding potential violence in the workplace and assignment of oversight and prevention responsibilities. It's basically a statement to all employees that it won't be tolerated um, and that you're going to have to take measures to prevent those things from happening. Uh, Anti-violence statement that covers all your workers, patients, clients, visitors, contractors, and anyone else you know your folks may come in contact with. Uh, and the hazard assessment that I talked about and your security analysis. So you do the hazard assessment and you figure out, okay, what, what security measures do we need to take place? Do we need to implement, whether it's lighting, security guard, um, you can only enter the facility using a certain type of, uh, of key, for example. An assessment should consider whether certain physical can changes can reduce employee vulnerability to violent incidents. And the prime example of that would be just better lighting if you're open late at night. So those are the, some of the things that you can implement in terms of putting a, uh, a workplace violence prevention program together, which OSHA views as a feasible abatement method. Uh, along with some of the other things that I mentioned on the prior slide. In addition to those things, some other things that you can consider and put in your workplace violence prevention program is uh, develop workplace violence engineering administrative controls. I went over those kind of things. A record keeping system designed to report any violent incidents. So you want to make sure that you have a, a way for employees to communicate um, incidents of, potential incidents of workplace violence before it gets out of hand. Develop a workplace violence training program and a review of the workplace violence prevention program. So once you put your prevention program in place, you want to review it on a periodic basis and how often you do that is up to you, but at least you know, my, my recommendation to clients is at least once a year. So you can analyze how effective your program is um, and are there anything that happened over the prior year that you didn't anticipate so that you can revise your written program and train your folks accordingly. And you kind of do like a, a, like a, a mini audit of your, of your viol workplace violence prevention program. Develop procedures and responsibilities to be taken in the event of a workplace violence. Um, basically a, a workplace violence plan so that if something happens, how are you going to respond? And the last two really relate to that, which is you know, develop a response team. Uh, so you're going to have a team that's going to respond to the incident as well as a crisis management team who uh, would investigate what happened, why it happened, and if you do have a workplace violence prevention program, what can you do to uh, amend that program to make sure that uh, the workplace violence doesn't happen. So with those feasible abatement methods and these and the workplace prevention program that I just discussed, those are the kind of things that you can do to substantially reduce the risk of workplace violence happening in the, uh, at your establishment. And you know, I, I recommend a lot of these things, um, almost all these things, to clients, whether you're in a high-risk category or not. Uh, because the, to me, the issue is not really whether OSHA is going to show up or not, but whether you can reduce this risk and protect your folks. And just wrapping this up, um, you know, if you have experienced acts of uh, workplace violence or become aware of threats of violence, you should take steps to reduce the risk. And in fact, um, you know, I have a lot of clients even that haven't experienced this kind of thing, uh, have started to develop a program to prevent even a threat of violence down the road. And one of the best things that you can do is uh, develop and implement a workplace violence prevention program combined with all those things I talked about, um, having a reporting system in place, uh, having cameras where needed, lighting where needed, security access where needed. Maybe you have a security guard, which is an example of like administrative control, or you have employees come in and out of certain areas so that you can prohibit, uh, let's say, someone from the public from attacking one of your workers. And finally, training. Training your folks on what to be aware of, uh, things that could 
potentially save their lives in terms of risk that they may be associated with that they may not know unless you train them. Um, those are the kind of things that um, I think you should implement and I recommend to my clients to implement to help reduce workplace violence. With that, I'll take some questions. Okay, the first question we have today is what is the time frame from start to finish that it takes to put a typical workplace violence program together? And is the second part of the question, uh, does it depend on the size of the company? It does depend on the size of the company. It also depends on the risk, you know, whether you're a high risk industry. So if you're a, in the industry of providing uh, late night retail establishments, for example, the kind of abatement methods or workplace, uh, the, the, the workplace violence prevention program, the volume of it is going to be di very different if you're not in one of those uh, high-risk industries. Typically, I've seen companies roll out a workplace violence prevention pro program within 30 to 60 days. And after they've done that, they will analyze it at, you know, within that year to figure out where they are and where they need to be. The next question would be, how often do the employees need to be retrained? And the second part of that would be, do you train new employees when they're hired or at what point? So after you've developed, you've, do, you've done a hazard assessment and you figure out what kind of industry, if you're in a high risk industry, and you develop a workplace violence prevention program, uh, then you're going to train folks. You know, my advice to clients is to train new hires and existing folks. So your new hire would go through training where they get trained on basic safety measures. Well, you train them on workplace violence, your, pre your prevention program. And in terms of once they're already there, provide them annual training on your workplace violence prevention program, just like you would, for example, lockout tagout. Okay, our next question. In a previous slide, I believe the speaker mentioned that OSHA would would not respond to a threat of workplace or workplace violence concern of a coworker. Could the speaker elaborate on this a little? Yes. Yeah, so, if you have two employees, um, they get into a fist fight, for example, and one stabs the other one, and they, that person dies. You have workplace violence, right? But that doesn't mean, uh, and you call OSHA and you report it because someone died, that doesn't mean that OSHA is going to show up to do an inspection. In fact, their compliance directive basically says that they reserve the right not to do an inspection because they're going to focus on um, the other types of risks that I talked about. Uh, for example, somebody, you, you're, you have a bank, for example, and someone comes in to rob the bank. And I think that even though that's less prevalent than coworker violence, I think that um, I'm reading between the lines. I think that the reason why OSHA is reluctant to get involved in inspections with coworker violence is that because it happens so frequently, and they would be they don't really have the resources um, to do inspections for coworker violence. But that's just my hunch. Okay. Second part of the question from the same person was. What about workplace violence of a manager to an employee or severe bullying or intimidation of an employee by a manager? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. It said, what about workplace violence of a manager to an employee, such as severe bullying or intimidation of an employee by a manager? OSHA considers that workplace violence and believes that you should have a workplace violence prevention program and implement that program. But that doesn't mean that um, if there's an incident, OSHA is going to do an inspection. But in that situation, if the employee notified OSHA that they were being bullied or intimidated or uh, if there had been physical contact, uh, would they respond? So I, you know, I can't speak to every area of office, but according to compliance directive, the answer is no. Okay. And the next question we have is, 
can you briefly touch on an em employer's responsibility as it relates to a former or terminated employee? Is, it, is he required to mention an act of workplace violence to a future employee, and can he be held liable if he does not? I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay. I think the way I'm reading it says if you've had a former or terminated employee, mm -hmm. are you required, and, and, and that employee has exhibited um, uh, acts of aggression, mm -hmm. are you required to mention that to future employees and present employees uh, and uh, you, from a liability standpoint? From, I can't really uh, talk about from a civil liability perspective, but from an OSHA perspective, you should inform your employees um, that there is an incident or there's a particular issue without naming this individual. Um, and you, take, you implement your workplace violence prevention program. And part of your program is to cover those kind of things. Um, another point, if I had an employee that had been violent in the past and he had been fired, he or she, do I have to, if somebody called for a reference, would I be required to reveal that violent nature of that person? I don't know anything, I, I do not, well there's nothing in OSHA law that requires you to identify them, or there's nothing in OSHA law that requires you not to identify them. Okay, and and you said you you can't respond as far as from a liability situation that well, if what, that person then went was hired by the other employer and uh, then had a violent act that say caused the death of somebody would they be able to come back to a previous employer and say you didn't reveal that when they called you for a reference? Um, well, every state law is different. So I, you know, I don't know. It depends on the state law. Right. Okay. Um, next question. What if all signs are that the workplace violence could occur, but has not yet? Should the employer be proactive? Yes. I think that's the whole whole point of a workplace prevention program is to be proactive to minimize that risk. And that. I know um, some companies in their programs, they express to the employees that if they have a personal incident that's happened off-site and a problem with a um, family member or a uh, mate that uh, they need to notify the employer needs to be notified so that if that person came on site, uh, they could apply the proper protection. Is that correct? Are you asking me about a particular law? I'm, I'm no, no. I'm just saying is that 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 would be the is that be, that would be best practice that if you uh, yes that that you instruct the employees that if you have somebody in your life that is that has potentially threatened you or that you have a uh, that you were concerned about uh, that they could come to the workplace that, that you need to be notified so that you can prevent them from uh, gaining access. Yes. So even though OSHA may not show up to do inspection, but that's the whole purpose of you know, the report, you know, having a system where employees can actually report these kind of things. Okay. Well, um, we don't have any more questions at this time. That I see. Uh, is there any other items that you can think of or situations that uh, that you can want to talk about, or you want to wrap it up at this point? I you know, believe we can wrap it up. Um, just my overall advice to clients is to analyze your risk and take steps to lim eliminate those risks through a workplace violence prevention program, regardless of whether you're in a high risk industry or not. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Again, thank you. thank you for attending today's webinar. In the near future, you will receive an email 
directing you to a replay of the webinar and the associated documents. Also watch your email for announcements about future webinars and be sure to visit the ASA website at www.asa.net. Thank you and have a safe day.